Nothing's even plugged in. Oh, he's not even recording. Yeah, we're recording now. Welcome back to part two of this week's Yawa. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. I'm the guy with the pink gun. If this is your first time to our channel and you are watching this, uh, you should click down here on the subscribe button um, and turn on those notifications. Turn on those notifications. This is it. We have guests this week, guys. Uh, Laura and Tyler are friends. We're doing something just a little bit different. We are the pros and they are the average Joes. We're here to answer your questions to the best of our ability. And get a little bit of a different perspective. So let's get that perspective let's started. Let's go. From Mr. Danny Lopez on Instagram, I just bought two homing pigeons and they laid two eggs after one month. I haven't let them out of the That's cage yet. I see that both the female and male take turns sitting on the eggs. When is a good time to take a pigeon out to start training my six month old Brittany? Also, if I cross the wings or snip the flight feathers and play fetch, will the pigeon be okay to still breed in the future? What do you think, Tyler? You love birds. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm a big bird fan. No, I have no idea <laughs> have no how idea. to. I'm going to leave this pigeons. to the pros. Yeah, we, I'm pretty sure that's against city ordinance. In there you go. <laughs> uh, so to start off with, it sounds like you're headed in the right direction to have some homing birds, which is cool. Um, they are prolific breeders, so it shouldn't take long for you to have a crazy uh, inbred coop with just those two. Yeah, if you can get a few more homing pigeons to add to your coop, you're going to definitely be able to develop, like Ethan said, a pretty nice sized coop in a fairly short order. However, when you don't you're, yeah. play fetch with them, when you're trying to produce a homing pigeon coop, we use our homing pigeons for specific purposes in training from yeah. our positive pigeon drill to homing pigeon courses. Then when we want to do bird introductions, which it sounds like you're talking about doing with crossing the wings or pulling flight feathers or even just clipping those flight feathers, um, and you want to play fetch, typically we need to understand that these are bird dogs and there's a very real potential that that bird is going to be damaged and need to be dispatched or that the dog will actually kill the bird in this session. And we're training bird dogs. They need the ability to get on live birds for them to understand and not be startled by that situation when it comes up because it will come up in the field at some point. Absolutely. And if you can control the situation um, with a bird that you can make sure isn't going to scare them or have a bad reaction to then you're going to set your dog up for success. But there's a very real chance that your bird may or may not survive that. Brittany's sometimes can be very soft, but I still wouldn't risk it with one of my homing pigeons. Um, so you may need to just look at getting some feral pigeons, some barn pigeons. Um, we call them kill pigeons because ultimately that is what's typically going to happen with those birds. So um, it was a great question, and sorry I set you guys up for that one. I okay. thought it would be kind of funny. <laughs> but here, here's a real next question. Out West Bow Hunter, what is the purpose of the treadmill and how long and at what speed do they use it? So this is a great question. <laughs> the for you purpose guys. of the treadmill is when you come home at 530 in the evening in December and it's 20 degrees outside. You don't want to walk your dog, but it needs energy out. No, that's, we no, put, that's a really yeah. good way that it gets used. We put the both of our dogs um, on the treadmill most often in the winter, but we learned the treadmill from Cat and Ethan um, and it definitely isn't just about getting exercise physically, but uh, especially our, our female dog, uh, she's got a lot of mental energy and it wears her out a little bit mentally. So I think they both actually do different speeds and I let him do the treadmill mostly because our other dog hates it. And I don't like yeah. to be the bad guy. Yeah, she doesn't like to be the bad guy. So I'm always the bad guy. And uh, it, it really just depends on what they can handle. I mean, uh, one of our dogs can go five, six miles an hour for you know, 30 minutes and the other Straight. one can't. So, um, yeah, the mental simulation is actually more helpful than just the physical sim yeah, you know, stimulation. Yeah, because if you think about they're going five or six miles an hour for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that's not really that no. long in the grand scheme of things. Because when we go hunting with our dogs, we're hunting two, three hours at a time. A Average lot of time, way 14 more. miles an hour. Yeah. yeah, so definitely not necessarily a huge no. physical drain. Um, it can take the edge off when you can't get out when it's 20 degrees out or colder or lots of snow, depending on where you're actually at. But the mental stimulation of having to constantly focus, think about staying on that treadmill, especially if you can set up a cool interval program where the speed's yeah. changing, the incline is changing. Um, it's going to be a little more mentally wearing for the dogs that have to do. Um, yeah. And we just found a, a cheap one on, was it yeah. Facebook? It or? was Facebook Marketplace. Yeah. We bought ours. 
That's and, what I was going to say. Yeah. Is a lot of people ask, that's the next question is where can I get a treadmill? You can use any treadmill. Um, and garage sales, most Craigslist. likely there's going to be a, a potty accident on the treadmill at some point in time. So usually doing it in the garage or the basement or the someplace that's not carpeted. Yeah. <laughs> or, you think about it finished. and the dogs get running and moving and things get worked out when they're in the field running do, like that, yeah. they can just use the yeah. bathroom when they need to, if they're on a treadmill or tethered to that treadmill, um, that can happen on the treadmill. And then it, just keeps going around. <laughs> also, I want to mention when you are running a dog on a treadmill, especially if you are tethering them, um, you don't want to this leave is them not unattended. A, out. We're going to go a 30 minute run no. while I go run some errands right. or something. No. Yeah. And it's not, you're going to do a 30 minute run. I'm going to tie you to this treadmill whether you want to or not. That's definitely not what we're saying either. Um, even though I probably could benefit from somebody doing that to me, but um, that's not it's what those we're using. Dang opposable no. thumbs. I know. Yeah. I can we leave one dog on not. longer than the other. So, yeah. Because yeah. Ellie likes it more and Gatsby, it's. Yeah. It looks like he's been tortured while he's walking on the treadmill. Yeah, it's a it's a it's job for Gatsby. It's probably really tiring yeah. for him because yeah, like Not mental as... levels. Like Ellie's super duper smart, like Houdini crazy <laughs> smart, and then Gatsby is more of simple. a dumb jock. No, yeah. Yeah. simple dumb jock. Simple. He's very athletic, <laughs> he's our but little potato. <laughs> it's definitely Only. hard yeah. for him to <laughs> think that hard for that long. Yeah. So um, anyway, no, but the question. the mental stimulation is huge, and it's. It's um, the first time you run your dog on it, you'll see. I mean, you're talking 10, 15 minutes, they're going to be out. So, Good question. We get that question about the treadmill a lot. So. And the last point with that, we actually have a video that shows you yeah. exactly how we start a dog that's green and then show you um, a slightly more advanced dog. So we can throw that up in the description below. We'll put it in the description. below. <laughs> that's where it'll be. <laughs> Um, anyway, next question from Instagram, Sky the Blue Weimariner. I'm a brand new hunter and I've got a 10 month old Weimariner and I want to learn where do I start? Well, there's a lot of great places to start. Um, but I want to know where you guys oh, We started. started with Standing Stone Kennels. Yeah, that's where we started. <laughs> that really is what we did. We'd never had a GSP before, so. Yeah, we never had hunting dog. I've never had a dog, period, before I had my had Ellie. So, uh, you know, a lot of times you can stop moving the mic. Yeah, it picks <laughs> up every time you do it's like bong, bong, okay. bong, bong. Yeah, a lot of times you can uh, hit up your local NAVDA chapter. Yes. Or... If you have friends or family that hunt, but uh, I mean that's be a good spot to start. Yeah, dog dog training groups are huge, and I think it's a one of the biggest resources that are overlooked. Uh, there's a ton of local clubs, no matter where you're at, and um, even in the the big city places. Um, I think East Coast there's probably more Navda clubs and more dog clubs in the East Coast than anywhere else. I mean, and you still are talking probably upwards of a two to three hour drive. But you make a weekend out of it or something like that, and you're going to get a lot of experience, a lot of exposure. And, um, you know, it's getting a dog and hunting dog and being part of this, like it seems like you're active and ready to be, is a commitment. You know, it's not just a, oh, well, we might try and do some dog stuff this month. Yeah, it's definitely you get out of it what you put into it. So uh, there's a lot of great videos online. Uh, I would suggest our channel, especially if you're getting started with a pointer puppy. Um, you know, your Weimariner is a pointing breed. So we've got a couple great series out on what we did start to finish with not only obedience, but bird work, how to get them started pointing in the field, bird and gun intros, um, to shooting those birds over them, and um, some even more formal training than that. So if you haven't checked out the rest of our videos, check out our playlists um, to get started as well. And then those local groups that you can go and put some of this to practice that you're watching these videos and learning from there is a really great start. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, a lot of these people in these groups are very, very helpful and they want people to succeed with their dog. So uh, they're going to be out there and they're going to go above and beyond to help you out. If you just ask, they're not going to just come up and do it for you. You got to ask questions. Yeah, and don't be afraid if it's a group. I mean, uh, us are we're recreational hunters. I mean, we don't uh, make a living out of it, unfortunately. 
but we, you know, we, we tried a couple of different groups that were not our fit. They weren't what we were looking for as new hunters, because as he said, we, I had never been uh, upland bird hunting. He'd never had a dog. And so we uh, found what worked for us. And now we've had dogs. We've had Ellie almost five years. So um, Google was semi-dangerous with a new puppy. So I, like I said, don't be afraid to leave if it's not your fit either. Yeah, go with your gut. And if you don't feel comfortable with what somebody's telling you that you should be doing with your puppy, uh, question that. Reach out to a resource that you do trust and see if it's something you should be doing. So. And the, the last uh, point to touch on with that, you go to these clubs and these things, and there's a lot of people there that are really willing to help if you ask, but be also willing to assist. I think that's yes. the number one mistake that people make is they show Don't up. Don't be a like, freeloader. Yeah, no. I got my dog trained. See ya. Right. Uh, there's no, always birds gotta, to be set, birds to be caught, things to be um, things to able to jump in and help with. Plan sure. to make a day out of it and go and learn by helping, learn by doing, and then get to spend some time with your dog. For sure. Um, next question from Josh Merwin on Facebook. I woe trained with a belly collar setup. All went extremely well, but she tends to break without it on. I'm positive she knows when it's on and off. I would, I could put a belt around her belly and she won't move an inch, but take it off and she creeps. Any words of advice? It's not every bird contact, but about 25%. She's a year and a half GSP. So a couple things with that. First of all, uh, you are working on this at just the right time. Um, we are just starting Legends Woe Training, and we're actually putting that um, video mini-series, if you will. It'll be three or four videos, probably. Depends that, how long it takes them. Every dog's different, so it will be a minimum of probably three videos. Though. Yep, that we'll go through step-by-step step and, and explain exactly what you're talking about. And it just sounds like maybe there's a small lack of um, conditioning uh, between the belly collar and the neck collar yeah, stimulation Yeah, that points. transition from the belly collar to the neck collar sounds like there might have been um, an issue there. So. Yep. yep. So I don't think you're too far off, uh, but definitely um, take a look at the videos that we have out coming, uh, upcoming here probably this next week, and they're going to be a lot of help. Yeah, and if you aren't already subscribed to our channel, if you subscribe, you won't miss those when they come out. So next question from Prime Short Hairs on Instagram. If we have plenty of quail to train with, but don't want to fork out several hundred dollars on launchers, what is the best way to run through, say, 20 live quail with my eight-month-old pup? The best way that I would do that is probably fork out a few hundred dollars for some launchers. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> it, you have to have you have to have quality birds, and that's the biggest mistake that that's I think I people make. Say. And not that um, everybody's budgets aren't different. I fully understand that, and people were able to train dogs a long time before electronic launchers, especially the quality of the electronic launchers out today. Like we use DT systems launchers. Um, very, 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 very good timing. They open the second you push the button and it all happens right when you want it to. So that is, um, it's been a huge advancement in training today, but it definitely allows us to be very efficient in our training as well and yes. make every bird contact count. Uh, Absolutely. And then, like Ethan was saying, though, the quality of your birds is going to make or break your situation if you don't have launchers. So 20 live quail isn't the same as 20 live flight, con quail, flight yeah. conditioned quail that yep. can fly really well. Because if you're trying to train your puppy on those quail and there's an opportunity for your puppy to not necessarily point and they go in to bust that bird and they catch the bird, well, then they've just conditioned themselves and basically gotten... Um, reinforced for busting in they got that bird they got that reward whereas if that bird would fly really well and just fly off then that's not necessarily going to have been a bad situation because that's what we do with the launchers they fly off we're 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 controlling that flush but that's happening and the bird gets flushed and the dog doesn't get the retrieve and they realize hey i need to be more cautious next time so a couple tips with quail um they are probably my least favorite bird to train with but if you do these few things it's going to help a lot one um, you need to pick these birds up almost immediately from the time like before you're going to be training with them don't pick them up on thursday to be training sunday afternoon uh, because your quality and health of those birds are going to continue to go down and down. Now, unless you have great flight pens or something like that that you're housing them in and mm -hmm. a good situation, but if you're crating them in a box, keep them in a box for days. a few days, they're going to be weak and yeah, not good. 
The next thing is uh, fruits and vegetables. This is going to sound a little bit weird, but throw in um, either pieces of orange or apple or cucumbers, watermelon, watermelon all of those things that are a, a waterier, a waterier, a word, a more waterish, pleasant fruit, vegetable. I'm making all kinds of words up now. Um, things like watermelon, cucumbers that have that really watery texture to them. Quail love. So cut those up, put those in there that they can peck those and that'll keep them hydrated. And I, I would typically call watermelon, maybe it's a sugar high or something, but watermelon quail are crazy. Okay. They're crazy. Crazy. Quail. Quite crazy. <laughs> um, but then uh, with quail, their second flight is typically better. So if you set the bird in one form or fashion, you can sleep them, you can dizzy them, you can tuck them in the grass, you can do all of these things. The more you handle them, the less likely they are to be quality flying birds. Um, I typically, unless I have very specific places that I need quail to be, I would recommend just flying a few out of the box and they may just like hop out and start to run. Uh, then bring your puppy into that area, work those birds. If they aren't injured, they're going to pop and fly and do their thing. And a little bumping and chasing isn't that big of a deal. Just don't be killing those birds that they're making mistakes on. So continue to work birds until, until you get, you get point. some pointing. Um, even if the point is short, you can start to reward that. That's not a huge deal. But uh, the key is, like Kat had mentioned, that they don't get caught. So if you're keeping those birds healthy, giving them some fruits and vegetables if you have to keep them for a day or two, and then um, flying them out of your box so that when your dog interacts them, it's actually their second flight, they're going to be a lot better off. Good question. Next question from WDC Outdoor on Instagram. At what point do you determine a dog is ready to go on its first upland hunt? Tyler. Good job, Tyler. Well, has it pointed any birds, or have you done introduction to guns? That would be a, a big pretty one. big step there. Um, besides that, I mean, if you got a place to go, a 10-month-old, I think, is what it said. Uh, no, no, that no was way. the last question. Oh, that last um, but they just asked, what point would you say your dog's ready to go on their first upland hunt? I, For me, it's the, the bird and gun introduction would be the biggest for me. I... We got our first dog. She was born in August, and we picked her up in October. So she obviously wasn't going to be going hunting that first season of her life. And then Gatsby was actually born on Christmas. And so by the time hunting season rolled around, he was almost a year, and we took him out. Yeah. Um, it so, definitely depends on the age of your puppy, yeah. whether you get a winter puppy yeah. that's maybe uh, too young to start yeah. the season or a uh, spring puppy, a spring puppy yeah. that's got time to develop. Yeah. We didn't expect anything from Gatsby. He wasn't productive at all as a hunter, but we got him exposed. Uh, he figured out that pheasant don't stay in a launcher, you know, when he's pointing one. Um, and that's for us was as soon as we felt comfortable enough that we weren't going to ruin the dogs by taking them out and firing guns as we, we put them in a field. Yeah, and that's definitely the bird and gun introduction. Check that off your list. As well as I would throw in recall, yeah, collar yeah. condition to recall, because you get a young dog out in these new environments, a new field, these areas they may not have been in, and they go chase haywire, a deer. Yeah. Or chasing chase a, deer, a deer or chasing yeah. you know, a hen that you're not shooting, yeah. and then you're trying to get them back, and then they get lost. That could be a bad situation. Yeah. So also a great you know recall would be a good foundation. If you have the opportunity to have had your puppy exposed to an opportunity to learn how to point, that's great too. But like we've mentioned, dogs, bird dogs can learn to point on wild birds. So if they've never done it, but they've had the bird and gun intro and they've got a recall, start taking them hunting. Um, they may not be super productive, like you said, their first season, but they definitely can learn a lot from getting out there and being exposed to a hunting environment. So the checklist is bird introduction. Gunfire introduction and recall. Recall. I, I think you're pointing pop up. like right. They're going to pop up right here. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. That's where I wanted them to end up. Okay. I got you, babe. Thanks. <laughs> Time for our last question in this uh, part of Yawa from Grant Wagner Zero. Would it be bad to hunt a pointer with a flusher during his first season? This is why you get German short or something. This is not a me question. I don't think it would be good. You're going to teach a lot of bad habits uh, with that pointer. You want that pointer to stand still. 
So when it sees another dog flushing, it's going to want to join that other dog. So I think it's a very valid point, especially with a puppy. Um, like you're saying, I would agree with you, Tyler. First, first season, it's going to be better off if they can run by themselves. And once you get to the point where they will establish and hold point and stand steady, great. You can start to introduce that dog. Now I wouldn't do it on your hunt. I would do it in training situations and, um, it can be developed and taught with a dog that typically is steady enough by, and also understands, whoa, has whoa training done. Um, and then you can help them to stand there while the dog goes in and flushes. Um, if it's just you and your buddy or just you and you have your two dogs, just run them independent of each other. And then you have a fresh dog for each field. Yeah. But like Tyler said, and like Ethan had said, you're going to potentially create some naughty habits. And if you've got a young dog and it's their first time out hunting their first season, we want to put as much emphasis on the good things that we can put together for them than setting them up for failure and having that competition of that other dog getting to make those, you know, flushes and then getting on those retrieves faster. Uh, that dog is going to get impatient waiting and they're going to say, why am I bothering? This other dog is getting rewarded for flushing. Why can't I too? And we need to condition them at least probably for their first season of no, this is how we hunt. We need to stay steady on our birds. That's why we have a pointing breed. Absolutely. So, great question. Thanks every guys for thanks. Thanks everybody guys. All this is why he doesn't also word. get to read the questions. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in for part two this week. Uh, we will be back shortly. I am the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Kat the dog trainer. And our guests? Laura. And Average Tyler. Average, average, Tyler. average Tyler. That's his new, that's his new Instagram yeah. hashtag. I average wanted to Tyler. Yeah. Average Tyler. It's, it probably already exists. We'll, we'll be back soon.